Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of having to settle for mediocre are over. Welcome to Project Relationship. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. Join me as I explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Let's go. Hey, everybody. So we're going to get to our episode in just a second, but I wanted to make sure that you heard about my latest offering because people have been asking, how can I work with Jolie? And I would love to work with you, but you all have such individual relationships. So I would love to see you pop into my next free live training. It's the best way. Yeah. My eyes, right, directly, your relationship. These are small, intimate groups. We're just going to meet in Zoom and we're going to talk about what it is that you want and how you can get it. Go to my website, joliehamilton.com. Click on the work with Jolie tab. You'll see some live trainings and master classes coming up. Grab a spot at the next one and we'll see you in there. Okay, everyone, you're probably going to get a double welcome on this episode, and that's because we recorded it with an actual other person again. And that means that Ken and I broke up our recording sequence, but it's been completely, completely worth it because today we have an episode that we recorded with Leah Marshall. Leah leads this amazing community online. It's a Facebook um, community called the Esther Perel Discussion Group. And there's over 13,000 members in this group. And something that I've been really impressed about is how in this group that she, you know, has somehow just brought into being, they discuss sex, desire, eroticism, polyamory, infidelity, relationships of all types, and they do it with such care and grace across the board. I've really been pleased to be a part of the community myself and to just participate and watch and listen from each other. Because I think one of the things that we forget about in relationships is that there is no one right way to do it. And so when we listen to other people's stories about relationship, we always, always come out with a net gain. So this episode, Leah has joined Ken and I to talk about solo polyamory and also just some of what comes up with couples privilege in polyamory and what happens when you're figuring out how to be consensually non-monogamous and you want to do it with a real sense of treating other humans really well. I cannot imagine a better topic to take on if we're going to talk about doing unconventional relationships. So I will delay no further and we'll jump right into our episode with Leah Marshall. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And we have someone with us today, which is super exciting for us because usually it's just the two of us sitting here recording in our bedroom, which is my one of my favorite things about the podcast. We're just sitting here on our bed. But today, Leah Marshall, you get to join us on our bed, but from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to virtually join your bed party. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we got to make do. A pandemic taught me a lot of things about connecting to people over the distance even people you want intimate connections with. That's right. Make it happen. So Leah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you and I connected recently over the topic of jealousy, which comes up for me a lot in the context of, well, all kinds of relationships. Um, relationships that are consensually non-monogamous, relationships that are experiencing the after effects of an affair, but want to transition back to monogamy. And when we connected, I noticed right away that you and I share something really, in, really foundational. In, and that is that we both believe that your relationships can be as good as you imagine them to be. I, I could feel that coming off of you. And that's why I was so excited to talk to you. But you also have something very different going on in your life. Um, so I would love it if you would just share with everyone what your polyamory looks like. Because um, Ken and I are in a hierarchical, um, anchored, you know, nesting situation here. And that's one way that polyamory and consensual non-monogamy look, but it's not the only way. So if you tell us a little bit about, about your way. 
Sure. Um, so I identify as solo poly, and I feel like I imagine many of your listeners are going to be familiar with that term, but just like polyamory can be defined in a variety of different ways, I think solo poly can as well. Um, some people define it as being self-partnered, which doesn't really resonate with me because I feel like, well, all human beings are self-partnered. You know, it's the longest and deepest relationship you'll ever have is your relationship with yourself. How I see it more is, um, you know, I, um, I just turned 40. Uh, I've known for a while that I really don't want to have kids. Um, marriage has never really been a dream um, or something that I'm drawn to. Um, and, you know, for the majority of my life, I have lived alone. Mm-hmm. And I really like it that way. Like, I like living in my own space. Um, I have a lot of passions that I pursue from dance to the relationship group I run. And it's really important to me to have dedicated time to be able to devote to those and to focus on them. Um, Because when I'm around other people, I like to be present with those people. So I love living alone. I don't really dream of being married. Um, I definitely don't want kids. And, um, And I like really like those elements of my life. And at the same time, um, well, you know this, uh, Dr. Jolie, but I run a relationship group. Relation, relationships are my passion and my purpose. And so while I really value my autonomy and my freedom and my time to be alone and recharge because I'm an introvert, I also deeply value relationships and intimacy and connection. And so that's kind of how I look at being solo poly is being able to really elevate my freedom and my autonomy while also elevating valuing relationships. I love how you put that because when I think about people who love relationships, so often we just, we pigeonhole that. It looks one way. It looks like this, like partnered in a box in one particular way. And consensual non-monogamy opens that box a little, but it's not a full picture. So you are, you like to live on your own. Sounds pretty good to me. I live in a very crowded house right now. (laughs) I can totally see the draw. (laughs) And Ken, you have over the years identified in a more introverted style than me. There must be some part of you that's like, oh, yeah, you'd have a lot more time to pursue your your own passions. Well, and I'm I'm looking at where, so we're on video here and I can see where you're sitting and I'm thinking, okay, so you're in Chicago and there's like I'm picturing you living in a place where a lot of other people live and there's a lot to do and you have a lot of control over your own time. Um, and that sounds pretty good. <laughs> and your kitchen counters can stay clean. That's <laughs> that's like, impressive. It that's, really is. You know, I think that's reason enough. Not to a lot of people walking by and leaving your cupboards open. <laughs> um, and do you have um, uh, long-term relationships and things like that? Like what's your what's your commitment level to the people in your life? And I, I, since you just described your approach, I feel like some of my questions aren't even necessarily relevant, but I have to start somewhere. So um, yeah, how do you approach your intimate relationships? Yeah, so I actually only realized that I was polyamorous about just over a year ago. And what was interesting is Um, you know, I mentioned my age, so I just turned 40. And I think I had gone through life, like, deeply, deeply being a solo poly person without having the language or the label for it. Um, So rewind about a year ago, um, I was on a dating app with the mindset of being, you know, a monogamous person. And I ended up uh, connecting with a guy. um, And his initial photo was just him. And I'm really not a visual person. I'm very into words and energy and humor. That's like how I feel attraction. And so I always just like read profiles, which I know no one does, but I do. And, and I like really liked his profile and I, his initial picture was fine. And so I swiped and we connected. And then um, when I went through the rest of his photos, it was a couple and I'm, I'm not bisexual. 
And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I think there was a mistake. Like <laughs> I didn't realize oh. that you guys were dating as a couple. And yet at that point, like we had started kind of to develop some rapport. And he said, listen, I'm polyamorous. My partner's monogamous. We're looking to explore opening things up. And um, in his profile, he talked about tennis, which is like one of my passions. And so we're like, let's meet up in the park. Maybe we'll play tennis. He's like, I'll bring my girlfriend. We'll play some lawn games. We'll have a picnic. You know, worst case scenario, it'll be a nice sunny day in the park. And so I'm like, okay, like I'm down for that. So we met up and had a nice time. And then I met up with the two of them again and we had a nice time. And I kept reiterating, like, listen, I've been trying to explore in my head how flexible my sexuality is. And I really don't think, I think I'm just really into men. <laughs> you got to know that self, right? Myself. And she's like, that's fine. I don't think I'm really into women either. So she's like, listen, you two like each other. Why don't you go on a solo date? And so we go on a solo date. And meanwhile, you know, I mentioned like kind of my erotic blueprint is very energetic. So I like anticipation and I like talking about things and I like, you know, flirting. And we were doing a lot of that and like developing a lot of energy. So we have our solo date. We shared an act of physical intimacy. And of course, I'm like brand new. I'm brand new to this. So it didn't occur to me that like a lot of what I was sharing with him and a lot of what we were doing was going to be shared with her. So bottom line, he talks about the act of physical intimacy with her, which hadn't really been discussed in advance. It was something that was, you know, okay, approved with his girlfriend at the time when the two of them met, but not with respect to me. And, um, she got upset and, and he uh, asked for a two week pause. And oh. I said, I said, listen, like when I'm experiencing conflict in relationships, I communication is really important to me. And I said, we can pause on seeing each other. We can pause on the physical stuff, but I, I really need communication. I'm not comfortable with the, this two week pause. And, um, and I think they just had a much more or he probably had a much more hierarchical approach to relationships. And it was interesting because I thought he was pretty emotionally intelligent, but if you're hierarchical and that's kind of the way you see your relationships and it's like a secondary partner would be about fun, but I need to make sure like the primary partnership is in a good place before that happens. So bottom line, um, it was, that, that was my first exposure to it. And um, what's interesting is I was brand spanking new to polyamory, but because I'm so passionate about relationships, I think I brought a lot of like rela relational skills to that moment that really helped me show up for myself and have solid boundaries around what's important to me. So I share all that to say that that was during the pandemic. Yeah. So I kind of, I discovered my relationship orientation during the pandemic. Um, I've had a couple like here and there short-term dating experiences since I'm currently exploring some relationships with people, um, but I'm pretty new to polyamory, but also like pretty well-versed in um, a lot of the topics that you cover on your show. There's the thing, you bring up such an important point. It is not actually, to my mind, what defines someone's relationship structure is a completely internal thing. It's it's so much about how you're approaching your life rather than how many people you're sleeping with, and, which is like the, the jump people make. It, and you also mentioned something I just wanted to circle back to. What hierarchical means to different people is so important because I heard you describing someone who had a very particular way of like uh, that included probably rules and approvals, possibly some veto power going on. These are all things that aren't part of our version. When I say we're hierarchical, I'm thinking about, well, practically speaking, we own a house together and we share a bed and we have kids that we raise together. So I would hate for somebody to come in and think, oh, it's just all gonna feel super equal because realistically speaking, that's not something that we can provide. But I, I have been a secondary partner myself and it's a tender topic for me. So the idea that 
that I would get to decide what's okay for someone else to experience in their relationship. This is this is pretty much why I do the work. So I'm glad you're bringing this up. Bringing yeah. relationship skills is the whole game. It doesn't matter how many people are, are involved. Yeah, the way that I look at it is, you know, the difference between descriptive versus prescriptive hierarchy. Yeah. So very comfortable with descriptive hier hierarchy, which is like, well, we own a home and our finances are entangled and we raise kids together. So it's going to be messy <laughs> yeah. because of that. Like we're going to need to spend more time with each other. And like that makes so much sense. Of course, I think where it gets tricky is when um, someone's in a hierarchical relationship. And because of that, they say, if my primary partner is triggered and there's conflict with the secondary partner, I'm not able to simultaneously hold space for and show care and consideration for both people. I'm only able to focus on the primary partner and it's only once that relationship is in a really good place that I can pick things back up with the secondary partner. Yeah. So that's not okay with me. And then similarly, when uh, my metamor has boundaries and my primary partner, or sorry, my partner takes on his primary partner's boundaries as his own. So he's not able to kind of show up for me and have my back in the same way that he has, you know, is showing up for and has the back of his primary partner. So those are two things that I really look for early on. Yeah, yeah, I and, and, appreciate that. And yeah, absolutely, because I hear you describing a situation where ideally everybody understands what their own boundaries are. And but enmeshment makes that and, but challenging. Enmeshment, yep. Is this my boundary or is this your boundary? And have we ever talked about this boundary? Is it either one of us or boundary? Or did we make something up out of our own heads and it gets really complicated really fast? So, so you have to keep talking about them. Right. So I heard you name something that I, I teach and I, I practice, which is that communication cutoffs are, you know, they are, they are violent for many people, yeah. not all, some people really don't experience that, but many people experience them as, a, as, as, as deeply wounding as they would a physical um, exiting from your life. And when it comes, when there's, whenever you have the, the, all the, the rules that allow for something like a complete cutoff, we're, we're right up against we, like real harm is always just sort of a hair's breadth away. And I don't know whether you've experienced this um, too, but I know myself when I was a secondary, I, I had this bodily sense of sort of always living on an edge that I didn't know exactly where the edge was because the boundaries weren't, they weren't really about me. It, it was as if I had been stripped of the ability to set boundaries and um, yeah, that took years of digging out <laughs> years. The reason that I was commenting on knowing, knowing your own boundaries is at that time when, when you were I was a my secondary, secondary to you. partner. Yes. Um, yeah, I, all these things that we're talking about so smoothly, I had not a clue about any of them. <laughs> uh no, and no communications wow yes. that was not a good situation at all i mean your your experience of me was complete chaos there was there wasn't consistency because i didn't understand my own boundaries plus i was letting whatever boundaries i did have get swayed by my primary partner and mm -hmm. I, mean, I would get confused which would leave you confused but but you were in a situation of um, um, well, there was a disequilibrium of power. I, I, there we go. Thank we didn't you. have like so in this in in these situations, we're always talking about some power and influence sharing, right? What happened for you when you stated your boundary and said, "I need communication"? Wanted to raise two um, points that came up. Number one. What was interesting, because I think you talked about a little bit of enmeshment, mm -hmm. I think there was a dynamic in the relationship of the person who I just described, where um, the girlfriend was working on not people pleasing, but that was a compensatory strategy she had developed. And so I think there was a pattern of like, 
kind of like, yeah, you can go on a solo date with Leia, no problem. Whereas that wasn't her truth. That was like the people pleasing. Like that wasn't a step that she was truly ready for. Yeah. Um, and so wanted to bring that up as couples are looking at opening up, like looking at their relational patterns and seeing, you know, what I mean, if, we always talk about like, if you, if you can't, if you can't go out on individual hobby dates with yourselves already, like there's something to look at, like you've got to, there has to be some basic detangling before 100%. we even get there. And a lot of times that doesn't exist. Like, like you're saying relationship to self ideally would be the primary relationship. But if people don't have that right now and you jump ahead to, can I go get a blowjob from someone else? Can I go out and, and take this person to a hotel? Can I go and spend money on someone else? Like those are huge steps. These are like big yeah. things, just throw people into the deep end with. It was interesting because there was a post in the relationship group I run recently where there was um, a man and him and his wife are in a consensually non-monogamous marriage. And I get the sense that he's kind of agreed to it and she's really interested in it. And they had some rules around number of sleepovers per month. And she had a partner who was in town and she wanted more. And what was interesting is there was a series of um, people pleasing moments where the guy said yes, when you could, when you could, you could just tell like he, it made him uncomfortable. And, um, and then there was a lot of resentment towards his wife. Whereas really when we're violating our own boundaries, like the real resentment is towards ourselves for not showing up for ourselves and upholding our boundaries. Right. right. And can you speak to how you, how you do that for yourself? I'm, I'm just super curious because as a person who has a lot of autonomy in your life, when you, when you come up against your, a boundary for yourself, are you able to quickly communicate it or do you still struggle even though you're practicing so much communication and autonomy? Yeah, and I realized I didn't answer your last question. Um, so you had mentioned the power, the power dynamics at play when you're a secondary partner. And what's interesting to me is oftentimes I kind of feel like the threat yeah. Like, I feel like I'm perceived by both the person I'm dating, even if it's on a subconscious level, like I and like you. Even, that. Yeah, that, that might even be part of the erotic, thing. right? Like, right, right. Playing with that. Yeah. yeah. Whereas what I experience is um, I'm very open to dating other solo poly people. The reality is there are a lot more primary partners than solo poly partners to date. So I tend to date people in primary partnerships and it feels super vulnerable. And I don't know if um, primary partners realize this, but to be the secondary partner, it because you are entering a massive power dynamic. And even if they say like, listen, we're not hierarchical, we don't have veto power, you know, we don't practice, like all of those things that would be things that I would stay away from or not entertain. Like the, the reality is if, if they're primary partners, probably at any point there could be veto power or they could you know, close off their open relationship. So it does feel vulnerable. And I need to constantly like kind of just bring myself back to the present moment and know that like no matter what happens, like I'm gonna show up for myself, which kind of gets to your other point about like, how do I show up for myself? It's interesting because my mom, right around the time I was a teenager, like 12, suddenly became very manic and bipolar. Mm -hmm. And it was super challenging. And it also taught me to have really good boundaries. And um, I mentioned like relationships are my passion and my purpose. And so I've also dedicated a lot of like time and learning to boundaries, because I think boundaries are just like really one of the most important skills that you can learn, not just for romantic relationships, but just like for life in general. And so I would say they just, um, it, it comes pretty easily to me because I know myself and I've learned the skills to communicate like my truth. So going back to the example I shared, what happened, so back to the two week pause, right? Where I'm like, um, communication is really important to me when there's conflict. And basically the guy that I was seeing said, uh, 
I, I don't think I, or I, I can't give that to you. And so they took time to, uh, to sort things out. And basically he regrouped and said, my partner and I aren't on the same page about non-monogamy and we're working with a therapist and we're going to see if we can, you know, try to find some middle ground. And he said, could I circle back with you in a few months? And I said, um, it's really important to me that I'm seeing someone who's able to show care and consideration for my feelings and his primary partners. And, you know, um, yeah, like able to uh, have, yeah, able to show up for me and have my back while also like showing up and simultaneously like having the back of his primary partner. And basically he said, um, I don't think that's, um, you know, something that I'm able to do. And I said, totally respect that, like wish you the best. And then he did actually reach out about six months later because him and his primary or his girlfriend had broken up. And he said, would you be up for trying this again? And I said, I feel like what caused the conflict before between us was that we have very different relationship philosophies. You're much more hierarchical, a much more, I don't know if we call it like egalitarian, but I think that was the term that I used at the time. And, um, you know, he's, because he wants kids, he wants a family, I don't want that. So I, I knew that I wouldn't be a primary partner. And I knew that he was looking for a primary partner. And I'm like, I feel like when you find someone who's your primary partner, we're just going to be bumping up against the same relationship philosophy difference. And, <laughs> and I said, I really need to feel like the person I'm dating or involved with romantically, like has my back and is going to show up for me. And he just really, he's not in a place where he's interested or able to do that. And so that's kind of how we ended things. Yeah. I, so I appreciate that you were able to name something that you could, that you were, you were thinking out, well, how would this play out yeah. and, and not just um, casting a golden halo around, around everything and saying, oh, it'll be fine. Cause I have found the same thing um, happens with in particular, when I'm dating men who um, they're, they date polyamorously or what they think is polyamorously in between their monogamous relationships, like mm-hmm. they sort of bounce and, and as if, as if the in-between time, I, I can be very disposable. Yeah. I, and that's and the same thing. I had to learn the hard way. Oh, no, I have to actually, I have to set this boundary for myself and I have to actually anticipate because they don't think that they're lying about it. Like they don't yeah. think they're promising something they can't give. They just don't have the experience to know you did not mean to hurt me. I uh, did not. But you <laughs> did not know <laughs> what I, you were doing and you had so much power. Yeah. So I had some some um, like completely untrained sociological <laughs> observations to make. <laughs> um, entitlement plays such a huge part in in these situations that we're describing. Um, people have primary partners. So me as, as a man with all my white privilege, white male, all the stuff that I, that I have, um, it took quite a while to learn how I was affecting you because I thought that the power that I had, first of all, I didn't acknowledge that it was power, just danger all by itself. But, um, I, I didn't notice how the the way I was treating you was dehumanizing you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I hear when, when you say, so I would like to continue communicating. That's, I, I so applaud you holding that boundary because to say, oh, that is a person that I don't need to talk to right now. I feel is just when I would do that to you, I would stop thinking about your feelings, but you still have them. You're still a person. You're still out there. Um, that's not, that's not a good way to be a human. That's not a good way for us to have a human community. It's dividing it up into pieces and treating my primary partner as more of a human than another person. And I, I hear you, Leah, claiming that, that spot of, of egalitarian. We're all humans and we all need to figure out the complexity of, yep, you're my primary partner. And I have commitments to you, but now I have established a relationship with someone else. 
that relationship can't be con can't um, it can't be contingent it on can't, whether yeah, I'm it can't be contingent on the quality of my relationship with you unless there's some other discussion that has already happened where we have all agreed about something like that. And even then and even then there's still the like the fundamental human right of yep. yeah, my, being there, <laughs> being in the world. Did you find that setting that boundary for yourself, did you feel more set up to go into your next like I know myself when like when I finally established, like, oh, my boundaries are being violated. I I knew I had to do more work. I mean, I, I did more therapy, I did more, but I also had to just go out and practice. And it is scary at first. Like, oh, I'm just, is this just what I'm gonna get over and over again? Yes. I think there's also kind of a shadow side to it, which I experience now, which is that when you have these experiences and you have the clarity of. I never want to experience that again. And I don't want to have relationships where that's a dynamic ever again. Um, it's tempting, especially because I enjoy talking about relationships and I'm very comfortable talking about relationships. There is this really tricky balance when you're entering into new connections. You know, one of the reasons that I'm drawn to polyamory is the communication norms. Like they're just very natural and it's it's how I enjoy communicating proactive thinking things through being super clear about your needs and your boundaries and your wants and what's okay so so all of that comes very easily and is of interest to me but the the shadow side for me is if I'm entering into a new connection that tricky balance of asking the questions that allow you to really vet, is this something that I, you know, is this a person I even want to meet in person? Because yeah. is there alignment versus like too proactively going into your boundaries, which I think for some people, especially if they're not used to talking about this stuff with ease and frequency, it can be like a, whoa, like too much too soon. And that's, that's an area that I'm really working on for myself yeah. right now. So I hear that. I, I've seen it play out recently. Um, there's a bit of presumption, like that the relationship. So it, this reminds me of how we still, I, or at least this is how I experience it. I still accidentally put relationships onto the relationship escalator and start presuming the forward path, not as a, a level and even thing, but like, oh, it's going to keep getting more intense. So I'm starting to play out scenarios and, and have conversations that sort of presume a certain outcome when in fact, I might be in just a very casual connection and I have to remember not to escalate too, too quickly in my, in my imagination, which is such a powerful place. Yes. Um, yeah. What about, I just heard you say that, you know, so you, you claimed that for yourself, you claimed the space you've made space. What about in a situation like the scenario that was posted in the group where you have two people who are like, they're not on the same page. How are you seeing it play out in your community that people resolve that? Like, what are you seeing as, as some of the positive ways that people are getting to the next place? Okay, so, um, you know, you guys have talked about your polyamory why and like growth being number one. And I would say growth is way up there for me as well. Sure. And a lot of, I have two very close, friends who are in mon formerly monogamous relationships that have opened up and um, at least for one of them growth is like a, a highest value as well and to me this is where the like the beauty of polyamory can manifest so there's someone who um, the man um, let's let's assume that a uh, pattern he's experiencing that hasn't served him in relationships is this people pleasing. So mm -hmm. his, his wife has asked for something that for him doesn't feel safe or appropriate. And he says, do it anyway. So to me, like mining the gold in that story is for him to, to work on that. So that would be like, number one, the, the patterns that you're having or that are playing out in your relationships but number two and I suggested this to him is rather than having a rule around the number of sleepovers what is the need behind the rule 
And what he said, it's for me to feel like, to feel like seen and valued and appreciated. So rather than having a rule, which is getting broken anyway, because of the people pleasing, how can, like, can you make a list of 20 different ways that your wife can express that to you that would be meaningful? And to me, like, this is the work of polyamory. Like, this is where the magic happens. Yeah, yeah. That, because that's, that's such great. an actionable step. Yeah. That's, that reminds me of when somebody has a baby, I'm like, put a chore list on your fridge. When people come over, they should choose a chore before they hold the baby. Like, put the list of how you want to be loved right on the fridge. Don't be afraid to make it possible for your partner to do the things that will make you feel seen. There is this bizarre mystique in Western culture around if my partner can't guess it, doesn't just know, if they just don't get it, then it doesn't count, which is yeah. foolish. And, <laughs> and my experiments clearly show me that the, the guessing is not required. It's the action that, that really pays off. Yeah, and along those lines, I'm sure you've heard of I know this was originally from the Gottman's research, but Esther Perel says it as well, behind every criticism is a veiled wish. Yes. And it's a lot less vulnerable to criticize than to ask for something when someone might not give it to you. And so anytime I hear like a criticism, like the example I shared about the sleepovers and the rule, it's like, what is the wish behind the criticism about the sleepovers? Um, and that's like an instant relationship fix that I like to turn Great. to. It, it is. And, and I love the, the suggestion of basically opening up the imagination. What are other things that will serve the same purpose? Right. So right. that uh, I know that I have been, um, I fall into the, the trap sometimes of being too, too black and white in my thinking. And if it isn't this thing, then it's nothing and nothing could possibly work, which that's a good way to be unhappy most of the time. So opening up the imagination into, right, sure, that works. And you know that works. But what about some other things? And That's great. I heard you say just like naming the need. We Over the weekend, I did this workshop and we were talking a lot about learning to recognize what, what our body wants, what our, what our body needs. You know, what are they? A lot of us are detached from our actual wants and needs. We we have a list of things we think we need or think we want or think we should want, but we forget to actually check in. And this came up for us recently about sleepovers, in fact, oh, that's right. about yep. there was there was like a miscommunication between our our um, like we didn't have any trouble. There, were, there wasn't a rule that was being violated, but each of us was having a bodily experience of like, something feels off, something feels off. And it was manifesting in an argument about whether there could be a sleepover. And the irony was that underneath it, each of us was having a full body, no reaction to this person, not to the sleepovers because instantly another person en enters the picture and we're like, oh, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, right. No amount of doing the work stops you from having to continue doing the reflective work. Yeah. <laughs> like We still had to come back and, yep, check in again, figure out, because the rule would have got, done no good. A rule about whether you can sleep somewhere, it, it doesn't, it, the, the, the soul isn't satisfied by rules. It doesn't care. It wants something more than that. You're naming a, a really... Um, the, I think the magic, the magic of polyamory, the magic that we get, it's right in staying in the communication when it's uncomfortable, staying with ourselves when we're exploring something new. And I just want to say how blown away I am to find out because I didn't know you had only been actually practicing um, the skills of consensual non-monogamy for a year, but you now are going to be my poster child person for like it's the relationship skills. It's not about whether it's not about monogamy versus non -monogamy. these things. Yeah. It's the relational um, aptitude and then the practice and the willingness to be in, in it. Because now you have, uh, I see you answering questions time and time again in your relationship group. And right. like you answer from a place, it doesn't matter whether somebody's monogamous, non monogamous, recovering from an affair, it doesn't matter. You just keep bringing relational skills to the forefront. Let's just bring that right up front and center. And from there, work on it. I love that. Yeah, 100%. Well, 
would you tell everyone where they can find you? Because your group is a wonderful support for people. I want them to be able to find you easily. Yeah. So I founded and lead the Esther Perel discussion group on Facebook. Um, I imagine many of your listeners are familiar with Esther Perel. She's an author. She's a speaker. Um, I feel like she's kind of like the preeminent therapist, like pop culture therapist of our time. Yeah, I think she is. And um, she actually just did the most magnificent interview with Brene Brown on Brene Brown's podcast. The um, sociological and the psychological <laughs> meeting. Yes. Yeah. Um, but so you can find us on Facebook. We're a community of over 13,000 members from across the globe. We discuss all of the topics that Esther covers in her books and her work from relationships to infidelity, to sex, to modern dating, to masculinity, um, and it's a very um, supportive, non-judgmental, no shaming is allowed. Um, we really try to just ask questions that will help the poster share Esther's work and interviews. And um, we do Facebook Lives in the group like the one I just did with um, Jolie. And um, I also have a YouTube channel where I take the videos that if anyone at my work would find them, I would get fired and I share them on YouTube. So not all of the videos we do in the group, but a lot of them and the interviews are on my YouTube channel. And um, that's pretty much it. So we'll put that stuff in the show. Yeah, we'll have that all in the show notes so people can click over. I want to say as we wrap up that, so I study Jungian psychology and Mm -hmm. um, there's a, So to be a Jungian just means to have been inspired by Jung's work, right? Like there's plenty to throw out too, but, um, but to have been inspired and you were the first place I heard somebody say the phrase Pirellian and I was like, that's it. Sometimes some, uh, uh, there are, there are people who come along, they write something, they create a body of work that is so powerful that it generates its own energy. And it doesn't, it's, it's bigger than one thinker. And that to me is the sign that someone has really, they really tapped into something necessary, something the world needs. And now you grow it, it it becomes bigger and bigger. So I'm thrilled. I love, I love hanging around the group and just seeing what are people talking about? What is coming up for people in relationships? So yeah, I highly recommend people hop on over and join. Yeah. And for anyone who's who's unfamiliar with her work, I would say if I could kind of capture it in a phrase, it would be embracing the paradox, like the yes and. Yes. Um, and she has a podcast called Where Should We Begin, which is simulated couples therapy, where she really uh, models that and exemplifies it. So people, I'll, I'll share a link for that so you can link it up in the show notes as well. Absolutely. Great. That's it. Once you enter the relational world, like once that becomes one of your like topics to think about. Yeah, there's so much good stuff out there. And I love that you shared that. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Leah. I, I love this conversation. I hope we can have you back because uh, yes. you bring a, a, a delightful perspective and you ask such great questions as well. So I'm excited. Thanks for, for being here. Thanks so much. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Ken. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. So we've talked quite a bit about how to do relationships, but I know a lot of you would really like to get my eyes on your relationships specifically. It's so worth it. And yeah, that's a bit of a hard thing for me to do for everyone individually, unless you're actually working in my coaching program. But good news, I'm doing some free live trainings. Yay! Yay. Live that's, that's awesome. I mean, I get it all the time. I'm with you all the time. It's I get true. lots of training and, and you discussions. You are just in one so... big free live training. And oh, wait, I'm... you pay for it. Okay, maybe I pay for it a little, <laughs> but you don't have to. Okay, so I would love to, to have y'all click on over to my website, joliehamilton.com. And if you click on the tab that says work with Jolie, you're going to see my latest offering for a live training. These are 60 minute masterclasses in how we can relate better. I'm going to be t- covering topics like creative monogamy, like how to transition into consensual non-monogamy, if that's your thing. And I'm also going to be talking about something that is really in my wheelhouse and something that we don't talk about on this show as often as we might, which is how to have a completely kick-ass relationship that really empowers you to be your full CEO, Mm -hmm. 
power player self. Right. So in my other world, I do a lot of business coaching. So bring it on. Bring it on. And you've all here heard us talking about our relationship and you have heard how she has addressed all of our issues in our relationship and how we talk about it. And she will turn that attention on you. And it is amazing what you can learn. Well, thanks. And yeah, just jump on over. Love to see you in there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.